Just want to extend a welcome to each and every one of you to Corner House this morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house, and it's good to see you all kind of intermixing and intermingling. That's so much a part of uh, what church is. Church is the body, and every one of us, are, we're putting on Christ. So we're really putting on kind of a show when we come together. Uh, but it's not a bad show. It's a good show. We're working together. So it's good to have you today. I want to remind you, Judy's going to come in just a couple moments and do the mission moment. Judy Longley is the chair of our missions team, and uh, she has the moment every month. She's going to tell you a little bit about a food packing opportunity we have coming up soon. So uh, I want to bless you with that. But uh, before we start, let's pray, shall we? Father, it's good to, uh, to see so many here today with... Uh, uh, distinguished looks, everybody, young and old, everybody's picked out their best, Lord, to come and to serve you with a smile on their face, even though there might be pain in the heart. Lord, we come together today and we put everything else aside. We want to throw off the old and put on the new. 
and give you, Father, the glory for it. Lord, you are everything. Lord, you are our A, our B, our C, our D, uh, our X, our Y, our Z. Lord, you are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Lord, you are the great I am. Father, we come and we deliver this worship to you. We lay our crowns before your feet in the name of Christ. Good morning. Well, it's this time again. We're doing the mill packing one more time. And uh, I know we'll be reaching over 7,000 people with food. Whether it goes to Haiti, it might go to Haiti, it might go to Ukraine, it might go to both. We're not sure yet. But uh, this will be a true blessing again once more for us to show our love for Christ in a special way by giving a little bit of our time, a little bit of our effort to do God's will and to help feed people who are hurting and need our help. So our sign-up sheets are in the back. We need you to sign up. Let us know we need 20, we need 35 to 40 people. So we need you here on August 20th in the morning. Uh, we want you here between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. We want to begin at 9. We need some young, younger men who are willing to come at 8 o'clock and carry in a lot of the sacks and things from the truck that uh, are difficult to get into the church. And we need younger men who can carry heavy loads to bring those sacks in. So uh, if you can come in the morning and you're a younger man or a young boy, uh, sign up. A, they have a special place for you to sign up that you can come at 8 o'clock in the morning. The rest of you come between 8.30 and 9. And this will be a great opportunity for you to help others who need your help at this time. Uh, Muffets and donuts and uh, coffee and juice will be available to you. And let's just all be glorified by serving God in such a special, special way that we can actually feed over 7,000 people in just a couple hours in the morning of our time. Have you got that much time to give to God? He gives an awful lot of time to us. So I hope you can find your way to do that. And please sign up today. Uh, I want to let you know Marv Westfall, who, uh, is with the Jackson, who was with the Jackson brothers, if you remember they were here a couple of years ago, has fallen off a ladder. He broke his hip and damaged his shoulder. So he needs our prayers uh, as he heals. He's not able to get out and, and, and bring in money to their uh, Save the Child uh, ministry as much as he could before. I know we sent them $100 to try to help them through that difficult time, and maybe we'll be able to send more. We're hopeful to. But keep Marvin your prayers. Uh, Living Proof High School, which we sent $500 to last year, is ready to open in January. And those of you who have taken on a child from Living Proof and send every month you send their support, that child will have a chance now to enter into high school where they didn't before, unless their parents could afford to send them. They couldn't go. Our kids, they complain about the half that go to school. They should thank God. They should thank God that that school is free to them and they have the right to go. They can go and learn. These kids want to go so bad, and there's no school. There was no school. They have built a beautiful high school, and it's going to be ready in January for them to go. So uh, 
pray for the Living Proof High School and also the Living Proof program for all the work they do. So October will begin September 4th, the first Sunday in September. So if you're going by and you see some socks on sale, grab them, because we need all those socks for these people at the rescue mission. And uh, we have done beautiful for years. We've been collecting socks for them and and we send out big boxes to them of socks. Men's, women's, children, babies, it doesn't matter. You, whatever you find and whatever you wanna buy, we appreciate it. And we're starting that you have two months to fill up that sock. Um, Fritz Hoy asked me to thank you all for sending in so much of the canned foods and stuff that they need to give out. And they put out a plea and he said the response was beautiful and people have brought in food for those who are uh, hungry that need help. And uh, thank he just wants to say thank you and keep the, up the good work so that we always have food to give out, the canned foods and the cereal, whatever else that's on the list. So thank you. The last thing I wanna say to you is I got, we got a letter from Arm and again, I read one last month, but I'm reading you another letter that was sent by a prisoner who receives Bibles and workbooks, which, which we send 200 every three months to, for, for that, to buy the Bibles and the books. He said, I was one of the truly lost. Most of society has given up on me and the world no longer had any use for me, but now, I am rich in spirit, and I want nothing but Jesus. The world threw me away, but Jesus graciously saved me from myself. He is my Lord and Savior. He has done more than renew my life. He gave me true life. His name is Robert, and he thanks people who send in money for Bibles and workbooks so that they can grow too and learn about Jesus even though they're in a dark prison cell. That doesn't mean God can get to them. He can get to anybody, anywhere, anytime, any place. He just uses us to get them there. So remember those in prison. Remember the ones that are in Russia right now that are in prison and pray that they can get out soon. I pray every day, every day for that Alexei Novelny. I don't know anything about him. I don't know if he's a Christian, but I know that God can reach him in that dark prison just so he can reach us. So pray for all of those prisoners and bring them out. And also pray for our prisoners that are in prison that may never get out, but could be a light, a shining light in that dark place. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Would you please stand and sing with us? The music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. You're looking
Our scripture today comes from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. All right, man, that's good. Colossians chapter 3, down just a little bit on the volume, please, Chuck. All right, everybody, y'all with me today? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be funny if uh, you never heard, thank you, uh, if you never heard the word Colossians before, it'd be kind of a weird word. Col we're going to Colossia. We're going to Colossae. So today we're, we're turning over in our Bibles to the book of Colossians. We're in the third chapter. Uh, if you go with me there, we've been in this series. And we're, we're, today we're going to be talking about uh, supreme living requires supreme clothing. You know, if we're going to put on Christ... If we're going to walk in Christ, we're going to need to put on Christ too. Remember, the Apostle Paul never actually visited Colossae, not once. He didn't plant that church, but he loved that church, and God, through his authority, sent him to, uh, to write a letter, moved him to write a letter. And he writes that letter because there were false teachers that crept into that place, and they were teaching that Paul's gospel was good, but it wasn't quite good enough. And we see that in our world today. We have a lot of people who look at the church, and you know, they think, well, there's a lot of goody two-shoes in that place, but they just think they're good, but we're just as good as they are because, well, our actions are just as kind, right? Our actions are just as compassionate. I have people that call me all the way, all the time around the holidays, and they'll say, we've got a turkey, or our club, we're doing this or that, and we want you to find people to give the food to. Uh, and that's a good thing, right, that people are working together in a community. But a lot of those folks are attached to a club, not a church. But this is the body of Christ. So do you know what distinguishes us? We have to put on Christ. If we don't put on Christ, we aren't distinguished from the world. And the way that we do that is we put on these quality characteristics that Paul is going to give us today. Uh, that Shelley, uh, I believe Shelley just read that passage. And in that passage in Colossians 3, there were several new clothing items we need to put on. So let me ask you a question this morning as we uh, get started. Uh, how often do you change your wardrobe? Anybody? change their wardrobe every year, your entire wardrobe. Nobody? Anybody? Every two years, your entire wardrobe. Every three years, anybody? Nobody? You know what the national average is? About every three years, people will go through clothing. They'll take off the old and put on the the new and yet some of us like me will wear my clothes till they do. I'll wear the old ones till they disintegrate, right? All right, but today I want to show you a proof of that is over here. I don't know if that'll set up there or not. Will you sit? Yes, you will. Good. All righty. I'm going to show you if you go through here. How many remember when the Cleveland Browns darted to Baltimore? And Baltimore's colors are purple and white and black, right? 
uh, well, guess what? Kim bought me this shirt for Christmas right around that time, this Browns jersey. What good was it then, right? Then we washed it, and guess what? The colors turned to purple. <laughs> Had to be a conspiracy in that thing somewhere, all right? Now, I remember the Cleveland, remember the shot heard around the world, Michael Jordan nailed that shot and buried the Cavaliers again, right back in the, uh, back in the late 80s, I believe. I got this sweatshirt, and I've kept it around for a long time. I don't want to throw it away because I, I like my Cavaliers. I, that's the best cover, colors the Cavs ever had right there. Uh, here's another one. A couple of you will definitely appreciate this, but I got this at a, a Christian concert, Ichthus Festival, back in 1980-something, and uh, it's a Phil Kagi shirt. And do you guys believe that I ever actually was able to fit into that? Anybody? Believe you believe it? I don't know. I, I think I, I bought the last one on the rack even back then. All right, here's another one. This is a gift from my brother last week. No. <laughs> Now, this is a gift from Jerry back in 1975 when I was all of 12 years old. It's, of course, an Ohio State Buckeye jersey. And, I, you know, it would be the day that I die that I wear this again, all right? The day of my death, I'll put this on again. But you know what? I love it, and I'm not getting rid of it. We have, I have clothes. How many of you guys have clothes in your uh, wardrobe that still have the price tag on, but you haven't worn? Anybody? Maybe you bought it and then you gained weight or lost weight or something. Now, I got these right here, and I haven't worn them. In th I've had them for three years. They're still sitting on my, my shelf. They're still hanging in my wardrobe, and they're wrinkled by now, okay? So we're called today to put on some new threads, some new clothes uh, in Christ, and that's the direction that we're going to go in a few moments. So the question today is how do you clothe yourself in the clothes that God has for you? What were some of those clothes that we had just heard in the passage? How do we clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience and forgiveness, all wrapped up and bundled up in what? Love. How are we going to do that? It's so important that we, we're, we pay attention. So today I'm going to cover three parts of this from that little verse, verses 12 through 14 in the book of Colossians, the third chapter. First of all, it's our call to put on those clothes. Secondly, it's the reason why we need to put on those new clothes. And then thirdly, it's the manner or the way in which we put them on. So go to Colossians chapter 3. Remember we talked about Paul likes to go in his epistles from the theology to the what? the meology. He likes to go from doctrine to practical. And you remember about three weeks ago, we talked about Paul uh, when he said he strenuously contended on behalf of the church at Colossae. We said that he believed it was his effort plus God's work, God's grace that formed this perfect partnership, this amazing partnership. Uh, so we have an active role at putting on these characteristics that mark the Christian walk. Remember, we're putting on Christ. We're not just putting on any clothes, but we're putting on Christ. So we have to make an effort to do that. How many of you recall over in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, long about verse 10, we're commanded to put on the full what? You know that. The full armor of God. The very same word, the very same verb uh, is in our passage today. Clothe yourself. Put on the armor, clothe yourself. You kind of get it there? Uh, and so it takes our effort, but it's also the Holy Spirit. So there's an in implication in both of these passages uh, that, that we're meant to partner with the Holy Spirit. So you're partnering today with the Holy Spirit. Uh, how many of you men, your wives, pick out your clothes? Anybody? <laughs> your wardrobe? No, but that's good. I like that. We're, we're independent men nowadays, aren't we? But you're working together with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us the clothes. He provides. We put them on. The Holy Spirit gives us the strength to put them on. We put them on. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, transforms our hearts as we wear these clothes. How many of you today went to your wardrobe and picked something out to wear? Maybe yesterday. Maybe you got ahead of things, right? Everybody did. Can we remember in the future when we go to our wardrobe that we're not just picking out clothing? I know you don't put stripes with plaids, polka dots, any of that stuff, right? You're going to wear uh, something that, you're not going to wear something that color clashes, but rather something that color coordinates. Well, we need to do that every day, take 
precaution when we go to our wardrobe to say, I'm going to wear today a little bit of one of these characteristics around in my Christian witness. So let's stop, and I need to unpack them for you. We're going to start this morning with the first one. The first quality characteristic here in the Bible mentioned is what? You see it? Starts with a C. Compassion. We're going to try on a little compassion today. Anybody here, you can say you are the most compassionate person here beyond a doubt, shadow of a doubt. You don't need this lesson. Anybody? All right, go with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. And we'll notice, remember the Lord, the Lord loved the unlovable. He reached out and he touched the leper, the unlovable. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Then Jesus, get this, circle the word, moved. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and he said to him, I am willing, be, be cleansed, right? You see that, how he reached out? How about over before he fed the 5,000? Skip over to Luke chapter 8, verse 2. I meant Mark, <laughs> that other guy. Mark chapter 8, verse 2. Mark 8, verse 2, Jesus says, I have compassion on the multitudes because they have now continued with me for three days and have not gone to McDonald's yet. You see it there? All right, three days and they didn't eat, and yet they were still there with the, with the master, with the Lord. And so he felt what? Compassion on them. Compassion literally means to have a deep gut feeling. How many of you remember reading in the Old Testament, in the King James, the bowels of mercy or the bowels of compassion? And those things used to make me queasy, that word bowels. But you know what? A bowel moves, right? Uh, and so when you feel it down deep in your gut, you got you to gotta act out. When you see someone suffering or struggling, you're moved with compassion on their behalf. Compassion moves Christians to do God's will on earth. I've often said compassion is pity with what? Pity with feet. I like to say pity with feet because we run, we're moved, we run to make an impact. Uh, so if it's God's will that we help the sick or that we love the unlovable or that we comfort the mourning or that we meet the needs of those who are hungry or what have you, oh, that's compassion it's the vehicle that moves us into acting into action and so the question today is are you moved with compassion uh, is there some injustice that you see in your world that you would do anything to correct you you're moved to correct that God may be speaking to you through his spirit today to try a little compassion we don't want to be heartbroken we do want to be heartbroken. We don't want to be heart hardened today. So ask God for some, some, some compassion. The second word here is kindness. We find kindness in the fruit of the Spirit over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. All right, we find the fruit of the Spirit over there. And so uh, kindness is what God did for us. For God so loved the, that includes us, right? He, he acted kind towards us so we could act kind towards others. In fact, the Bible says in Romans, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. That's right, exactly, trivia, repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. And so uh, a, kind, a kind person would tend to reach out to others and offer support of some sort. Anybody here, you see somebody who has a need for food, what do you do? You don't just smile, you go get them food. If somebody needs clothing, what do you do? You reach out and you give them the clothing. If somebody needs a, gallon, a, a tank of gas, what do you do? Go tell the preacher. He'll fill them up with the church's benevolence fund. <laughs> what do we do? You know, you're going to reach out and meet that need. That's what compassion does. That's what, uh, that's what kindness does. Uh, and so kindness is like, um, it's an outgrowth of our heart of compassion. It's taking the initiative to do something for someone that they cannot do for themselves. Ask God to show you a little kindness, give you a little kindness. Uh, the third one would be, I love this one, humility. Humility. True humility is to see ourselves like in the mirror as we actually are. A fallen Sinners before God in desperate need of a Savior. 
uh, you're going to hire someone in this culture, usually you're looking for uh, uh, characteristics like assertiveness and honesty. I was with a couple of our city officials. They were talking about having to hire. And the first words that came out of their mouth was somebody who is humble, humility, then honesty, uh, and assertiveness. Remember what was said of our Lord? Uh, we emulate Christ who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and he made himself in the form of a servant. The late great C.S. Lewis once said that humility is not thinking of yourself or less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less and less and less and less. If you go back to, the, again, the book of Philippians chapter 2, before Paul writes, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, he said we ought to consider others, consider others rather than ourself. And so that's, uh, that sums up humility. How about gentleness? Anybody else out here, you're just the most gentle little kitten in the world. You're, you're just gentle wherever you go. Gentle, 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 gentle. Anybody? Nobody? Gentleness is meekness, right? Same thing as meekness. And meekness isn't weakness, but meekness is power, but under God's control. Power, but under God's control. Uh, it's restraining behavior towards another. All right, if Dave made me mad, I might want to climb down there and give him a punch in the nose, all right? No, I wouldn't do that because he'd probably beat me up. But none of, what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrain my behavior even though he made me mad. Uh, the opposite of this would be excessive anger, desire for revenge, or harshness. Anybody go to a family reunion this year? A few of you? All right. You're under a pavilion, right? You're enjoying a picnic, and you're talking to your 96-year-old great aunt who's in a wheelchair. When all of a sudden there are boys outside playing football, that football grazes the side of your nose, knocking your glasses off into the corner of the pavilion. All of a sudden, you're what? What's the word? Stunned by that. You're, have you ever been stunned suddenly, startled suddenly? And then what's the tendency? You want to, what I call stun rage. <laughs> you want to be stun rageous. At that point in time, you have to decide, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to run and get that football and stuff it down the kid's throat? <laughs> are you going to throw it back at him as hard as you can? Make him feel what you felt? Some of us, we'd probably do that if we didn't get ourselves under what? under control. At that moment in time, better thing to do is go pick up the glasses, grab the football, kindly take the boys aside and say, you need to play elsewhere, but let me play some ball with you. That might be the best thing to do at that moment in time. That's gentleness. Gentleness places our strength under God's guidance. It's, it's a powerful tool for the kingdom. Friends, God enables us to be gentle, not gentle as kittens, but gentle like Jesus. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, the next quality characteristic is patience. And another word for patience is steadfast. You ever hear that? Steadfastness? I, I love that word because it really speaks to the heart of what, what patience uh, really is. Patience, to me, is standing firm against adversity without quitting. All right, it's, it's enduring opposition. Anybody here, I was, in a, I was up near Cleveland, going to the Cleveland Clinic a couple days ago, and I was stuck in traffic. When you're stuck in traffic and you want to get somewhere in a hurry, you know, you try not to hit your, right, I, got be, I only got beeped out once in Cleveland the other day, by the way, I really did, I did a stupid thing, but uh, nonetheless, yeah, people get impatient, they hit the horn, but maybe the best thing to do with patience is just grit the teeth. But the point is, patience to me, true patience is resting in the knowledge that God is in control. Uh, it, true patience is like this. If we have God's peace, then we also have his patience. But let me ask you, would people, are you a doctor today? Do you have lots of patience? Would people uh, say of you, now that, uh, yeah, that Fritz is a patient, he's a patient person. Would people say that of us, or do we lose control occasionally when we get frustrated? And people watch us, don't they? And we need to learn how to more better. I need to learn how to bear with other people because I'm not going to like everybody, and everybody's not going to like me. That's not, I mean, did, G, did everybody love Jesus? Everybody? Where are the people at? <laughs> you know, where's the crowd? Did everybody love Jesus? 
No. Think about it. The teachers, the law, the Pharisees. Uh, I, I always wonder, often wonder why he doesn't zap them out of heaven, you know, and straighten them out once and for all and just fry them right there uh, because he knew their thoughts. He knew their thoughts. He knew their attitudes. And yet he was, he was patient with them. You remember when he sent his disciples, Luke chapter 9, verse 52, he sends his disciples in Samaria ahead to a village to prepare for his coming. But when he gets there, they reject. They don't want Jesus to pass through. And so James and John were indignant about that. They came back to the Lord and said, Lord, be Elijah here. Come on, send fire down from heaven and fry them, literally. And of course, Jesus knew the backstory of the Samaritans. He knew how they had been mistreated and, and, and unloved by the Jews. So he had what? Compassion, everything here. He showed kindness. Uh, he had humility. Uh, mostly, though, here he's patient with them. And that's why we come back to the church here. This is our family. Do you get along with everybody in your family all the time? No. So we have to learn how to what? Be patient. Bear with one another. Uh, go with me to verse 11 in the passage today, actually, chapter 3, verse 11. Paul makes it very clear in verse 11. Here, I think he means church. Here, church, there is no Gentile or Jew, no circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian. Barbarians would have been um, non-Greco-Romans, I guess, people who were savage, the barbarian. Uh, Scythian, that has to do with people then who lived in lower Russia and the Ukraine. Interesting. You think those people would get along a little bit better, right? Uh, he says not, there's no slave or free in the church, but Christ is all and is in all. So Paul's clearly saying that no matter who we are, we're united uh, with the one another in Christ, and we deserve the dignity of others bearing with us. That might mean to restrain our behavior towards someone. That might mean to be a little bit more patient. That might mean to give second chances. It certainly means to forgive. Forgiveness is really the heart of this, so stop and listen to forgiveness. This is the, uh, the, the, the last on our list here is for forgiveness. It is the most important quality because we forgive because Christ first so we want to follow in his footsteps. That what we, that's what we do. But think about your things that you think about, the heinous thoughts you have, the, the sin that he's had to forgive in, in your life and, and in my life. I keep thinking last week Chuck gave a communion devotion, and he talked about the, uh, the point of entry in the wounds of Christ. Do you remember? He said those, those point, entry points were injected with our sins at the cross. He was pierced for our sins. Iniquities are transgressions there at the cross. And so he forgave us. He who knew no sin became sin, so we might become the righteousness of God. All right, so what, we, what do we need to do in response? Forgive others. Peter asked the Lord one time, Matthew 18, he says, Lord, how often should I forgive? Up to seven times? Because that's the tradition of our people, up to seven times. And Jesus said, no. He said, I'm telling you not seven times, but 70 times. That's 490. I mean, if I slap you 490 times in a row, <laughs> I guess the 500th one, you no, it doesn't mean that, does it? It means unlimited. But forgiveness never means that we're going to reconcile a relationship because you forgive doesn't mean you'll shake hands again. And forgiveness also uh, doesn't, it doesn't mean we're going to forget or ignore abusive or destructive behavior. Forgiveness does mean this, when you forgive, you give the right of justice back to God. You put that person in God's courtroom. You see, because if it were up to me and I held the gavel, it wouldn't be a gavel on you, it'd be a sledgehammer, all right? But I gotta release that to God. I gotta, I gotta learn to release that to God. He's the righteous judge, right? What I have to do is even tougher than that. He judges, I gotta remove the painful briars from my heart. Because if I don't take those painful briars out, then one by one, they turn into what? Bitter, bitterness, bitterness. One by one, bit by bit. And the only way, and that, now that's no good for a person. That'll kill you quicker than anything. Bitterness will. It's no good for a community either, not our Christian community. We need to get rid of all bitterness. Paul said that before, hasn't he? and put on forgiveness. Uh, and so let me ask you a question. What do all of these quality characteristics have to do with each other? What's the common thread here of all of these? 
That's right. We display these things in context of relationships. Uh, every one of these graces listed, we live out every day as we interact, starting with our family and moving into our Christian community. We live these out. Uh, notice there's no mention of virtues like efficiency or cleverness, not even diligence or industry. None of those are mentioned, not that they're not important as we live our life. It's just that these quality characteristics uh, are, are the, the rules that, basic rules that govern our relationships. So imagine if we were to add these to our lives. Everyone here, every one of us became the best at, at, at each of these qualities. Uh, imagine we would be the, the lighted city on the hill that Jesus talked about when he said, you are the, of the world and people would flock. They would flock to be uh, like, like you and like me. And, and so, you know, it, it also would do, go a long way to keep me from being such a selfish person that I am. I would think of others before myself more often. Paul says this in Galatians 5, 13 and 14, but through love serve one another for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So circle that in your mind. The whole law is fulfilled in that one phrase, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we make it our daily practice that today, tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next month, next year, we're going to put on these quality characteristics. Let's try to put on a little bit of compassion, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of humility, a little bit of gentleness, a little bit of patience, a little bit of forgiveness, and bind them up into love. And there's your outfit for the day. And that's the call, real quick, that's the call to put on these clothes. But there's a reason. This is shorter. We have a reason. So I want you to look back at the beginning of our passage again. What's the reason we need to put these clothes on? Verse 12, therefore, look at this closely. Therefore means it's therefore a what? A reason. A reason. Therefore a purpose. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and Beloved, I like to see so many versions said beloved, good, dearly loved, beloved. So let's go back to the start here and let's uh, talk about what Paul has been mentioning all throughout chapter three. Remember from last week, since we have been raised, set our hearts on things above, right? Since we've been raised with Christ, since we died to Christ, with Christ, let's put to death whatever belongs to the what? Earthly nature, earthly nature. But too often we get stuck in our old ways, stuck in our old uniform, you know. We don't want to give it up or give it over. Uh, and that old sinful self has absolutely no capacity to make me holy. And so Paul says, look, wouldn't you rather, you got all these old clothes here, but you can't even fit in them, Dave, anymore. And that's wrinkled over there and this and that. Why don't you put on the new clothes? We know that. That sums up the first part. But now, uh, he, before he even talks about the clothing here, he talks about our position in Christ. And Paul says, because of what Jesus has done, there's these three things we need to remember. All right, number three truths. Number one, look at from our passage we just read. Number one, uh, it's that we are God's chosen what? Take me back to Abraham. God called Abraham out of his homeland, called him out in the middle of nowhere, and he said, Abraham, look around. Look at the stars of the sky. Number them. Look at the sands of the seashore. So will your descendants be, right? So Abraham is going to be the father of this great nation. Wasn't just talking about Israel, though, because later on he's going to expand this in the New Testament. He's going to incorporate the Gentile. It, we're supposed to be lights to the Gentile. All right, so now how does it feel to be chosen? You ever been chosen for something? Maybe picked at school for something? You know, maybe you got picked as the best of something or maybe you got the first to be on the, the team or something and everybody picked you, whatever. We don't all get that. We understand it. It's important to be chosen. It's important to be chosen. Uh, and if we're chosen, then we've got a purpose. We've got a reason. It feels good to be chosen. Being chosen means that we have a mission. God has a plan for your life. Let's not waste it on these old clothes. That's the first one, uh, we're chosen. Secondly, we're holy. Now in the context of this passage this morning, holy has a couple of meanings. The first one, I know you know this, it means the holy, holy means to be set apart. Yeah, to be set apart, to be holy other, to be different. 
Now, it means that we've been called out by God to be different, to be holy. But I want you to stop for a moment. Let's unpack what that means. What's it mean to be set apart? Well, we can't be taken out of this world, can we? Because we've got to live here a little bit longer. It simply means we've got a holy purpose. We've got a holy purpose, a holy mission. And that mission, I believe, is to carry the love of Christ to the world that we, uh, that we live in. That's why we're set apart. Being set apart means we're reserved for a single purpose. I've got an exhibit here. This is exhibit A, I guess, exhibit one. But I brought my uh, brand new, brand spanking new toothbrush. Who said face brush? Oh, whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah, toothbrush with me today. And if I put this in my mouth, Pick on Fritz again. You want to try it now, Fritz? <laughs> he's going to come up and do it. He, I, he's crazy enough to do it. I got to go back and ask one of you. All right. Yeah, I mean, why not? I mean, why would you? <laughs> why would you? It's kind of gross, isn't it? Yeah, why don't you want to put that? Because it's been designated now for, for my mouth. How are you? Come on in. Good to have you. Good to have you. There. Yeah, it's designated for my mouth, isn't it? All right, for my teeth. Now, how many here have ever used a toothbrush for any other purpose? Any other purpose? How many, how many here uh, use it to clean spots off your clothes? It's good for that, it really is. You put a little uh, shout on there and rub it in, good, it's good. Uh, anybody else uh, No. Anybody ever use it for cleaning purposes? Like around your sink or your, dare I say, the toilet? All right. Now, if, I, if we were to do that, all right, and put the toothbrush back in our mouth and use it again, that would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? That'd be bad news. Would we be holy or unholy? <laughs> That's as unholy of an act as I could think of, honestly. And yet we all sin. Even after we, uh, we, we've got the grace that covers us, we all sin. So the second definition of holiness would be not just to set apart, but to be perfect and pure, righteous before God. We, we know that, and we know that I fall short, you fall short. I can't be. And so it takes the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the shedding of his blood, there is no forgiveness. And not only that, we don't realize this, but the Holy Spirit has to have a place to live in our hearts that's clean. How can the Holy Spirit inhabit my heart? No way. So that's why my, the blood of Christ cleans me up, purifies me so the Spirit could live in me. Uh, so don't get caught this week in temptation wearing your old clothes. Wear the new ones. Last point, are you ready? Last part here, that we are dearly loved. Again, we're talking about the reason why we put these clothes on, because we're dearly loved. Jane's version said beloved, I believe. All right? I like beloved anyway. I like beloved. I used to have, uh, years ago, I used to supply preach in churches, and I had one or two I'd go to all the time. And there was a little girl, a young lady in one of them that had braces on, I remember, and I'd say, dearly beloved, and she'd blush. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, beloved, let us love one another. You know, you are God's beloved. You are his treasure. You are the apple of his eye. Uh, you and I are precious in his sight. So let me share this verse Paul writes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How many struggle sometimes? You beat yourself up over sin or you have temptation or you struggle with the fact that you wonder if God loves you sometimes. You know, when I was, a, I was a boy, I remember, I felt like if I, if I did good things, that I'd be loved. I felt like if I did good, then people would love. But if I didn't do good, if I did something bad, then their love would be taken away. You know, sometimes we think that when we're kids, and, but not for the grace of God, we understand when we're older. But we still beat ourselves up, don't we, over, over struggles and sins and things in our life. And, uh, you know, that's why he wants us to put the clothes on because it helps us to live uh, better lives. I find it hard to accept God's grace and mercy. Uh, maybe like me, you just need a little touch of his love. Anybody ever hear that old s statement that goes like this? God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to what? Leave you 
that way. Fritz remembers that. Yeah, he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants you to be like Jesus. He wants us to experience that abundant life. Uh, that's what this wardrobe's all about that we're talking about. We're, we're talking about the last garment now, the garment that binds it all together. What is that? This is the way that we put these clothes on, the manner. What is it? Love. You know this. Look down at verse 14. 14. And over all these virtues put on, which binds them together in perfect. All right. You know, love expressed in community is the highest virtue. Uh, it all goes back to love. Love expressed in community. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In the original language, that simply meant loud noise. Bonging gong. Imagine how... Uh, irritating that would be everywhere you go. Bong, 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 bong. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. <laughs> it's all about love. It's got to start with love. The Greek word, by the way, for love in the New Testament is agape. And so it's, it's the only love, it's the only word in human history for love that means I give, but I don't expect. And so God sends us out to love the world like he did, giving, 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 not to expect in return. Remember finally today that love is the fulfillment of the law. Uh, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. How did he do that? Didn't do it by heroically conquering. He did it by shedding his blood, by, by demonstrating love. Uh, so he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. And he says to us, if you love me, that's exactly right. Thank you. If you love me, Obey my commandments. Keep my commandments. And thus we can fulfill the law of love. Remember he said to his disciples, he, he said, uh, the, greatest, uh, 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 the greatest is, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you what? If you have that love one for another. That's why this is the outer garment that wraps it all up. If we could wrap ourselves in love, we've got it all. You're going to fall, right? Everybody here is going to fail. I mean, uh, I'm going to fall down because I'm still wearing some of those old clothes. I haven't gotten rid of them yet. They're, they haven't disintegrated yet. So I'm still hanging on to some of the old. And I'm going to fall. When I fall because of the Holy Spirit, I could fall back in the loving arms of his grace. So church, as we close today, uh, you are his chosen people. You are a peculiar people. You are a holy priesthood. You are a kingdom of priests. Uh, and he loves you. You're deeply and eternally loved. So throw off the old self the sin that so easily entangles and instead clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bear with each other, forgive one another. If anyone has any grievances against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Would you pray with me? Father, we want to be the city on the hill that's lighted. Lord, we want, to, we, we want to be expressive of the fact that you called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. Uh, Father, we want to show that with uh, all these characteristics that we miss every day because we get so tied up. I go to my clothes closet and I think of me and I think, man, I look pretty good in that. Oh, man, I wish I could wear that again. Oh. Lord, it's all about me. Father, if it could only be about you, if I'd go to my clothes closet every day and start my day with just a simple prayer and say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. I want to add a little compassion. I want to try a little kindness. I want to put on some humility. I want to give some gentleness out today. I want to be patient. I want to be forgiving. And I want to bind it all up in love. And I'm going to do that. And if I try that test for about a month, let me see what kind of a difference I could make in my world, in my life. It's a decision time. And Father, now as I speak to these people, Lord, I, this is the time, folks, where this is decision. If you have a, a decision you want to make, we, we're praying for every one of you. If you have a prayer 
request that needs to be met. Ernie and Kay are going to walk down front. We also have a stage full. If they're not playing, uh, they can pray with you as well. So, uh, so let's, uh, let, let, let's prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper and this time of invitation. Let's do that as we sing. sin and death. Now you're risen. Everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay I belong to you. Lead me, lead me to the cross. To your heart, to your heart. Lead me to your heart. Good morning. Several years ago, a large newspaper in England sponsored an essay con contest on the topic, which is the shortest route to London? The winner wrote on the theme, the shortest route to London is good company. Isn't that winning essay true? No matter how long the trip, it goes faster with good company. Adam was living in the Garden of Eden, the ruler of all he surveyed. But God declared it is not good for the man to be alone. So God created Eve. 
What wonderful company Adam had. Is there any better company than to be with your own family? As Christians, we are on a trip to heaven. But it is not good to be lonely travelers. God has provided the church, the body of believers, and our brothers and sisters in Christ to be our good company on this trip through life bound for higher ground. On an ocean cruise, a traveler is highly honored when he is invited to dine with the captain at his table. But just now, the captain of my soul has invited me and he has invited you to break bread at his table, the captain's table. To dine at this table of memories is the ultimate of honors in the presence of the holiest of all company. Let us accept this invitation with respect, with reverence, with thankfulness that he desires our company at this communion table. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, we read these words. But we do not see Jesus, or but we do see Jesus, who is made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. As the family of God this morning, as the church who Christ loved and who gave his life for, as this good company of loved ones assembled here today, let us prepare to partake of the communion. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of communion. We thank you, Father, for your love for each and every one of us that while we were sinners, you sent your son, Jesus, into this world to die for our sins. So, Father, at this time, during this communion service, we remember his body, beaten and bruised, hanging on the cross. And we remember his blood as the nails were driven into his arms and the crown of thorns laid upon his head through this cup that we drink. So, Father, we ask you to bless us as we partake. Help us, Father, to leave this place knowing that we are loved by you that we are in good, good company. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us partake of the communion together.
Amen. <laughs> At this time, uh, we come together to pray for those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are in need of God's loving hand. So shall we bow our heads, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you clothed in your blood, in your righteousness, to lift up before you our brothers and sisters, those that we love for the touch of your healing hand, including Alan Rob Robineau, the family of Bill Vance, Paul West, the family of Rich Bates, the family of Ron Barr, Kevin Carpenter, Clara Marshall, Alice Christie, and Dave Ballinger. Dear Heavenly Father, each one of these were fearfully and wonderfully made, just as you made us all and knit us together. We know that you know the needs of those that we've just lifted up we know you know the number of hairs on their head. We pray now that you meet them in all sufficiency, that you would give to them that that they need right now. Also that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would be filled with love, with gentleness, compassion, and clothed with your righteousness to reach out to those in need those that are in need of your loving touch, your loving hand, and especially to hold them up in prayer continuously to our healing and loving Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 